you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives and cultures of the eight ghostly legions in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the victims of madness that make up the Penitent Legion. Penitent. Feeling or showing sorrow and regret for having done wrong. Repentant. Curious, don't you think? A definition like that should really not belong to a legion of race whose organisation is only connected by madness. At least, on the surface, that is how things appear. Madness to some are stereotypical raving lunatics, nut jobs in straitjackets that scream and howl in spongy rooms, speaking all sorts of gibberish. You know the sorts portrayed in media, and such chaos is one definition for sure. Certain figures in history have been portrayed as mad, people who are often bad to the bone, who display extraordinarily foolish behaviour, resulting in the deaths of many. This is another definition. Madness is also used to describe those having a serious mental illness, those that died through neglect and Alzheimer's, for example, also classify and complicate things, as all these examples could, in theory, could warrant a rave access to other legions. So, Explorer, what band of quote-unquote mad race does the Laughing Lady of the Penitent Legion accept? It is a trick question, because the answer is all of them, and the Reapers of the Penitent Legion will take them all with no questions asked and even less paperwork. Reapers in the Penitent Legion become quite the sneaky and aggressive lot as a result, taking whom and what they can, providing that said race, more or less, cover the Laughing Lady's guidelines. You can probably gather that the Penitent Legion is filled with murderers and victims of all walks of life, and the Laughing Lady has had her work cut out for her trying to organise such a varied lot. As we touched upon before, before, there is often a disconnect from perceived notions and hard facts. Treating, dealing and acknowledging mental health and manners is slowly getting better on the Skinland, and you can bet that the Shadowlands and Stygia are filled with millions of older souls that treated these fiends with great disdain and even with fear. Many of us on the land of the living still do live by those prejudices and stereotypes also. What is agreed, however, is that madness, in all of its forms, is seen as an extension of oblivion in the Skinlands. Willingly or not, intentionally or otherwise, much sadness is caused. Now you can see why they are called the Penitent Legion. They, the members of these occasionally called Spectres in Training, make up for the damage they cause to themselves and others by fighting and serving their fellow legionnaires twice as hard. The Penitents hate oblivion, more so than other race, attacking it how they can, practicing the castigation Arconos most. If I haven't shared this before, for I honestly can't remember, this is the Arconos that allows one to manipulate a control of Rafe's shadow. The Penitent Legion are very cautious around the heretics and renegades for this reason. They are outside the hierarchy's influence, so who knows who or what oblivion-driven thoughts are running in their heads. They view the Iron, Grim and Silent Legions as combat rivals, the four of them having excellent soldiers and fighters. There is said to be frequent cooperation between the Penitents and the Legions of Emerald, Paupers and Fate, mainly due to their shared eccentric natures, but even the latter three can only take so much. The Penitent Legion are closest to the Pardoners Guild. This alliance is not one of shared political belief or ideology, but a shared hatred for oblivion. Of course, this is all hush hush, and no one within the Legion would want you to say that too loudly, particularly the Laughing Lady. She dominates the Penitent Legion from the District of Sanctuary, a troubling place where laughs become screams, as one report described. Despite this, we understand that the confrontation is encouraged, at least for allowing raves who to survive to come to find both understanding and help. The seat of Sakor and Sanctuary is found within the centre of Stygia, and it is part fortress, part hospice, and is said to be nothing more than a giant black square rock that towers and looms over everything else. It almost sounds like like a gigantic tombstone. The penitents come here to come to terms with their plights. Some who misbehave are dragged there, never to leave again, which is maddening in of itself. Irony seems to be lost here, don't you think? Hmm? 
It is the role of the Order of Keepers to maintain the mental health of the Legion members. They offer counselling sessions, both one-on-one -on -one and in groups. They themselves also serve as the personal companions, bodyguards, aides and entourage to the Laughing Lady, performing many tasks and functions also. The Lady herself is never seen without her keepers, and rarely leaves the seat of Sarkor. She is said to wear a bony mask, whose face laughs more than the Lady herself. She doesn't laugh that much from what her findings tell us, and the mask looks more like something that will bite something in half rather than laugh. Some would be prepared to argue that the current Laughing Lady is more a figurehead these days. Yes, I did say current, but allow me to explain. You see, during the Great War, the Laughing Lady No. 1 was sent into exile via abdication by the Smiling Lord when he openly declared himself the new Emperor of Stygia. This was done by force, you know, and a false Laughing Lady was put in her place. The real Laughing Lady became a symbol for the loyalists of the Penitent Legion, who portrayed as a, as a saint and made the Smiling Lord into the ultimate villain. More importantly, she was the first and only Death Lord who was ever portrayed by her contemporaries as an ordinary Wraith. She went maskless during this time, wearing an, an innocent, wife-like face that was probably not her real one. The false Laughing Lady was pushed out and the Laughing Lady returned to her place of power when Charon returned. Now, I did mention that some proposed the idea that the Laughing Lady is more a figurehead. Many believe another seized control of her legion, an individual by the name of Liam, the main general and trainer of the armies of the Penitent Legion. From our research, we have learned that he was a former British tribesman who fought the armies of Rome when they invaded Albion. For 2,000 years, he has gathered and trained those who are under the Laughing Lady. Now, he thinks they are ready. From our sources, at least. Anyway, ramblings aside, I was conjectured that the madness of the Laughing Lady has consumed her as she plans to take over Stygia. Other theories suggest she whispered that she might have known something was going on in the labyrinth as thanks to the Storm Maidens. She was the Death Lord closest to knowing every nook, cranny, and quirk of the mazes of Oblivion. Others question why she didn't send her crack team down there to look for Charon after his disappearance, but we could be here all night with those sorts of theories. Oh, beg your pardon. The Storm Maidens Maidens are an all-woman specialised squad that does not fall under Liam's jurisdiction but answering directly to the Laughing Lady. Selected from the Storm of the Night, one of five military corps. Funny that the European-centric army division is called a corps rather than a unit. Anyway, the Storm Maidens are used as an elite strike force that dives into the Tempest to rescue stranded travellers and launch preemptive strikes on Spectre Hives. They are essentially the Laughing Lady's own personal hell divers. Well, with the mention of the Storm of Night, let us talk about the military in the Penitent Legion and why they are divided into five. It is quite simple, really. The legions were created to help end fans come to terms with their deaths and remain in touch with their mortals, helping them with their transcendence. When Charon declared a myth and nonsense was created by the heretics, the theory of transcendence that is, the attitude of the legions changed, becoming a military force of the hierarchy to fight heretics, renegades, the forces of oblivion and, well, anything else that challenges the might of the Dark Kingdom of Iron. Liam, who, as a reminder, is head of the military, devised five different units that tackle different tasks in the field of battle. Each also has their own banner that they use to rally troops into battle. The Skimmerisha Corps, the Storm of the Night, were the first division of the Penitent Army to be formed priding itself on history. They still use old-fashioned weapons such as bows and arrows and updated their jet black light armour only to keep up with the technological advancements. Many of the Penitents see them as war heroes and martyrs. It was this unit, or corps should I say, that Liam was inducted to, or what would eventually become the Storm of the Night. The Skirmisher Corps leads the armies into battle in an attempt to break up the enemy's front line for the rest of the course to follow, but only after using Argos to pull out their ghostly wings and pick off key targets, staging out the thick of battle. Their banner is a grey field with a gathering storm on the horizon and a single black lightning bolt ending in a spearhead that arcs across the sky. The Phalanx Corps, the Wall of Skulls, are the largest section of the army. They too could trace their origins before Liam's involvement, but their roles have changed more than the Storm of Night. They were the only unit at one point, with the others on supporting roles. But following a nasty loss against some Persian wraiths, the Wall of Skulls form the base of any formation, while the other units work around them. They provide structure to the chaotic attack of the rest of the army, serving as the front line, never drawing first blood or the last 
fast, only maintaining most of the fighting once the enemy line is broken. It is not a mobile corps and relies on the skirmisher corps, the Storm of the Night, to protect the exposed flanks. They weigh heavy armors and rely on musicians to keep a steady advancement beat. We believe they have a few banners, but the one most used and adopted is one containing a black field with a white skull at the center. From the skull sprouts white spears in the form of leg bones ending in metal points. The Beast Corps, the Razor's Son, is perhaps Liam's most clever invention, for these individuals make use of their Arconos rather than beating their foes into submission as the other legions would. The Beast Corps consists of several groups of six, one Beast Master and five Begasts, wraiths that have been transformed into fists of beasts by a ruthless combination of Moliate, Psychological Torment and Stygian Steel in order to withstand the heat of battle. These Begasts are somewhat different from your regular Goosely Beast, usually they are used to hunt down convicts and other unpleasant elements of society. In the Beast Corps, they perform military duty and are made from the most fiendish and criminally insane and are beyond recognisable beyond their metallic carapaces. Similar statements can be said for the Beast Master themselves, who are covered in hardened spiky insectile soul forged armours with hound like helmets with barred teeth. Bad teeth, I should say. The Beast Masters are summoned when the battles have been going on for quite some time, usually some days, as the Beast Masters work their Geist and some murderous frenzies, staying out of the battle themselves. They flank and attempt to attack enemies on the rear to both prevent retreat and drive them further into the arms of the other groups. Their banner is a blood red field and a white dog skull in the centre. The skull is muzzled and the reins lead to a black gauntlet below, which is clenched and bristling with spikes. Most menacing indeed! The Flesh Corps, the Tide of Horror, are the closest thing to a cavalry of the army and perhaps more monstrous than the Beast Corps. The Flesh Corps, as the name would imply, write horrible creations made from a horrible combination of soul forging and mulliate as they deal the decisive blow. These are called Lephiathans, who form the centre of the Flesh Corps, consisting of multiple raves that are so violent and out of control as to be detrimental to fighting forces. They carry raves in baskets on their backs called Howders, that contain spearmen, archers and snipers. The ones who ride the Lephiathans and other creatures actually belong to the Phalanx Corps. Supposedly, they are picked for the special duty rather than something they volunteer for. The Tide of Horror find weak points and hit them as hard as they can, even if it means some of their own are crushed in the process. The banner of the Flesh Corps may not actually surprise you. It is black with a red Leviathan rampant, standing on a grey, rocky outcropping. Finally, there is the Machine Corps, the Cacophony of Death. They are the second creation of Liam that strikes the final blows in a fight. Those within this unit pilot gigantic, hollow, soul-forged World War I tanks of scythes and battering rams attached to further the damage they cause when they crash into the enemy lines. What are they called, I hear you ask? Juggernauts! I know! How fantastic is that? They are powered by soul fire crystals, meaning when one is stopped, the fireworks is such the spectacle! They slice! dice and crush all those that come into their path, including the raves that march up to the thing. There are rumours that eventually Liam will replace the Beast Corps entirely with these monstrosities. Surprisingly, their banner does not include the Juggernaut at all, but a red cog placed against a rusty red cog in the centre, dripping a singular blood droplet. As for the civilians of the Legion, they are not too dissimilar from the usual bureaucracies within the other legions, but a far lesser scale and even less paperwork. See? All that chaos and all that variety! Despite the constant prejudices and mistrust launched from the other legions, the victims of madness are certainly a military and political force not to be ignored. They are loyal to those they trust and always fight back against oblivion's might. There's a lesson one can learn from this dear explorer, and that someone's illness or madness doesn't define them. It's a large part of who they are for sure, but it is not all of them. They are people too, you know. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.